Hi, my name is Mark Phoebe, a current grade 10 student at Scott's PGC College. Welcome to the second episode of The Lion and the Thistle. My name is Jack Perkins. I am currently a grade 7 student at Scott's PGC College. In this episode, we'll be looking at the formative years. Well, the road system was very primitive. I mean, if one can just uh, mention one, uh, one situation, the Cunningham's Gap was not built and uh, it was not being used. There was, a, there was a, another road called the Spices Gap that was used by the old uh, wool uh, trains that uh, took the, with the, the wool to market over the, over the gap, uh, over the range with, with bullocks. And that was the only that was the only road that uh, that was available. And there, there is a story of one girl who lived in uh, in uh, Bow Desert who came to PGC, and it took her five hours to drive from Bow Desert to Warwick. Uh, I think they had two two blowouts on the Spices Gap, and and a, and, a, and had to change the wheels and uh, and uh, the time it took uh, all all dirt roads and uh, and very very rough roads. And train was the, the, the simple means of transport that everybody could use. It was cheap and cheap and simple. But you could get, I mean, you could get there by car uh, if you had time, if you took time. But the average person without a car would use the train. By early 1919, considerable support had grown for the Presbyterian Girls College and the education it provided for girls. This support motivated the founding fathers of PGC, B.T. de Conlay and R.J. Schillard, to meet with Mr. W.R. Black, who had a proposal involving the education of boys. Mr. W.R. Black was so inspired by the success of PGC that he wished for a similar educational institution be created for boys and made an offer to help the establishment of this school. Mr Black offered to subsidise an amount of £2,000 for every £4,000 raised by supporters. decision was made to, uh, to open a boys' school in, in Warwick uh, and the Presbyterian Church had to be convinced that, uh, that the uh, committee was allowed to do it. Uh, my grandfather was the moderator of the, of the Darling Downs area, based in Roma. And, and my father, uh, who'd been brought up on uh, English books, boarding school stories, loved the idea of going to a boarding school and when the, uh, the church advertised that they were going to open the boarding school in, uh, in 1919 in Warwick, he immediately uh, decided that that's what he wanted to do because he was uh, completing his scholarship earlier that year in Roma and he'd have to be going on to another school somewhere at the end of 1919. So it was an ideal an ideal opportunity for him to uh, to make that decision, but he, <coughs> he nevertheless had to convince his father that it was the right thing to do, and I don't think his father would have had uh, much uh, hesitation in, in in accepting it because he was very enthusiastic, very enthusiastic indeed, about uh, starting a boys' school, a Presbyterian boys' school, in in that area. Well, he would have only been uh, twelve. Uh, with the year that he enrolled, 
Well, he always claimed he was the first. <laughs> and the story uh, goes that uh, he certainly made his application very early. Yeah. But uh, when he arrived with his mother, who came by train before his father, his father came later, uh, two or three days later, to be there at the actual opening. They came, they came early and uh, he uh, went over to the school and uh, left some luggage there and uh, went to stay with one of his friends who was in fact the, the police uh, officer from Roma that they knew very well and he stayed with them for a couple of nights. But uh, the, day, the day the school started, uh, uh, there was another chap who, uh, who had also left his bags there before, before my father and he claimed that he, uh, and then, but he got to the school that morning a little bit later than my father and he always claimed that he was first and my father said he was first but I think it's anyone's guess uh, and uh, I don't think we can attach too much importance on it even if both of them said that they were the first, pe first border at Scots. By June of 1919 the school's first principal was appointed. Mr. William Walter Victor Briggs, who had accepted the challenge of being the first principal of a young school wholeheartedly. Mr. Briggs was known to be an outstanding scholar and a man of culture and sophistication. He was also well known for his skills as a cricketer. In just over three months from original proposal of the Scots College, the college opened on the 28th of July, 1919. The school accepted its first students, taking in 16 boarding and eight day students. Mr. Briggs and the new students took upon the commitment of developing the school, physically and spiritually, creating the school that we are walking through today. The dedication of Mr. Briggs and the first students in developing Scots College created such a rapidly growing reputation. That in some years, borders were turned away due to lack of accommodation. A strong curriculum was established and stabilised. New buildings were provided and the school grounds steadily improved. He was an outstanding foundation principal and the Scots community past and present have continued to carry on the values and resilience that he instilled in the school. During the years 1925 through to 1930, enrolments continued to gradually grow. A maximum number of 117 students, with 103 students being boarders, was reached in 1930, which allows Scots to join the select group of schools in Queensland, with over 100 boarders. However, the Great Depression affected enrolment numbers at Scots in the 1930s. In 1931, enrolments at the college had reduced to 82, and by the next year had reduced to 74. The college was lucky to have a resilient third principal, Mr. Alan Tate, whose strength of character, resilience and commitment to the college allowed it to survive these hardships. Mm -hmm.